Hello and welcome to this live physics talk from the Atlas Collaboration. My name is Rebecca Gonzalez Suarez and I am a particle physicist working in Atlas. And today I will be the host of this live event. So in the next minutes, we will have a live talk that will be followed by questions at the end. So please use the chat, ask any question you may have. We are gonna collect them and we will try to bring up as many as we can at the Q&A session later. So we will also be taking questions from our Instagram account. So you can head to our stories there and you can ask also questions there and we will also ask them after. You can find the link to our Instagram account in our channel description. If you don't have it, you can go check there. So now let's think about the talk a little bit. So this is the fourth talk in our series. And as the previous three talks will also be made available in our channel after. So do check out the other talks also if you have not done so before, because I think they are all very interesting. But today in particular, our speaker is Dr. James Catmore. So Dr. Catmore is an experimental particle physicist working in Atlas. And between 2019 and 2020, he was computing coordinator for the Atlas collaboration. He did his PhD at Lancaster University in the UK, where he also worked as a postdoctoral researcher afterwards. And then he joined CERN with a fellowship instead of a couple of years, and now is a researcher at also University in Norway. He has been a member of Atlas throughout his career. And today he's going to tell us about something quite important in which he is an expert, the software and computing behind particle physics, something that is really relevant for what we are doing in Atlas. So hello, James. We are really happy to have you here today. And you can start whenever you want. Great. Well, thanks very much for the uh, nice introduction and good evening to everyone from uh, Oslo, Norway. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, computing and software uh, as applied to particle physics. There will not be any time, unfortunately, today to talk about physics, uh, but please, as you already heard, uh, look at the YouTube channel where you'll see three excellent talks on the physics that we're doing uh, in, in Atlas and at CERN. And if you go to our webpage, atlas.cern, you'll find a lot more information. So I'm not really going to assume any, uh, any knowledge for this talk. So I'll first of all give a brief introduction to computing. And then I'll talk briefly about CERN and its mission before I go on to discuss the ATLAS experiment and how ATLAS uses software and, and computing. And then I will briefly talk at the end about uh, the high luminosity, as we call it, uh, future. So uh, computing as, uh, really impacts now every aspect of our lives. It's hard to think about anything uh, that we do in our daily life that doesn't at some level involve computing. And today I will be discussing specifically how we use it to do our fundamental physics research. So computing really, it's, uh, there are four main aspects to it. Uh, there's the aspect of computer, computation and memory itself, the machinery that actually does the, uh, the calculations. Uh, and then there's the software that we run on that, uh, on that computation hardware, where we give it instructions for, for what we need it to do. We have storage, where we keep the data, uh, and we have network for transmitting information from between computers. And I'll be discussing all of these in the next uh, few minutes. So if we take computation, first of all, whatever device you have in your homes or that you use, whether it's your washing machine or games console or or your, your phone, or even a very uh, sophisticated uh, data center in, in Google or wherever, it all boils down really to this object that I've uh, shown on the right-hand side, a computer processor. And the way to think of this really uh, is the mathematical brain of a computer that performs calculations very, very quickly uh, in order to uh, enable it to do the tasks that we, we need it to do. Um, and if you look very closely uh, with a very powerful uh, microscope uh, at the surface of a, of a computer processor, uh, what you will see are tiny electronic circuits which are etched into the silicon that the chip is made of. These are called integrated circuits. Uh, and they themselves are comprised of something called transistors. And the easiest way really to think about a transistor is a form of electrical switch that can be switched on and off using another uh, electrical signal. So this really is what you find on this surface of a, uh, of a, of a computer processor. And using all these transistors, uh, we build up something called logic gates. And a logic gate is a small group of, uh, it's an electronic circuit, a small group of, uh, of transistors, which can perform very simple logical or mathematical operations depending on whether the inputs are on or off. 
With computers, you only have on or off, one or zero. That's, that's what binary means. Um, and if those of you who've either done physics or are doing physics or electronics at school may remember these tables that define whether uh, how a, a, a particular logic gate de de behaves, depending on whether there is, uh, the input is uh, on or off. And these can be uh, combined into more complicated uh, circuits. So the one on the left is a very simple one, and I've shown a more complicated composite one, and they can be made more and more complicated. Uh, until you build up uh, an overall, uh, a, a much more uh, sophisticated uh, device that can perform all the tasks that we need of it. And modern computer processors are mind-bogglingly complicated. Uh, they typically have more than 100 million of these logic gates etched in a tiny uh, surface of this, uh, of this processor. It's really quite amazing how tiny these circuits are. Um, and uh, in terms of the number of transistors, uh, the, the number that has since integrated circuits first came out in the 70s, uh, the number of transistors has grown. This plot is showing how many transistors were found on a computer processor um, with time from the 1970s to last year. It looks like this is a straight line, but if you look at the scale, each of these numbers is 10 times bigger. So 10 to the 4 is 10,000, 10 to the 10. Uh, is about 10 billion is 10 billion. So you can see that computers have the computer processors have millions of times more transistors on them than they had back in the 70s. And this has enabled us to progress, as you can see from these pictures, from very basic old-fashioned looking machines to the sort of sleek laptops that we uh, we have now. And this increase in the number of transistors uh, is something called Moore's law. Uh, and this says that roughly every two years, the number of transistors on this on a in a in a computer processor or a processing unit um, roughly doubles every two years. And that trend has started in the 70s, and it more or less continues to this day. And then on software, this is the instructions that we give to computers to make them do what we want. And the, the side of software that we interact with in our, in our daily lives are called applications. And I've shown some screenshots of typical applications, the things that you're used to using on a daily basis. And these are implemented uh, in what's called a high level computer language. Uh, and these are instructions that human beings usually um, write to the, to the computer uh, giving instructions as to how they want the, uh, the, the, the software to behave. And the, the, the reason they're called high level is that they can be read off the screen or off paper even uh, by a human being. And if the person is sufficiently experienced, they can usually understand just by reading the software what it's supposed to do. In the Atlas experiment, uh, the main high level language we use is called C++. We also use another computer language called Python for certain tasks. But for the big uh, mathematical processing, heavy duty processing, we use the C++ language. Um, and the, this, this software um, is, that's written in a human understandable form has to be digested by something called a compiler and turned into a series of instructions that the computer processor can understand. And of course, these have to be expressed as, uh, as ones and zeros. They get these uh, instructions get loaded onto the processor's memory. And then they get executed one at a time by all these logic gates that I uh, mentioned uh, uh, earlier on. Now, the more quickly that these instructions can be executed by the processor, the faster the computer seems to be um, to, the, to the user. And what limits how fast a computer processor can run is how long it takes all of these logic gates that I described earlier to change state. So for all the ones to go to zeros and the zeros to go to one, and then for this to be synchronized across all of these hundred million logic gates. This is the sort of what sets the limit as to how fast the, uh, the computer processor can, can operate at. And this is referred to, uh, this synchronization is referred to as the, as the clock speed. You sometimes see this on the processor, it has this many gigahertz or, or whatever. Now, if we talk about how fast the processor is, uh, again, if you look at this plot, you will see a similar effect that say from 1990, mid-1990s, early 1990s to the early 2000s, the computers roughly got uh, something like 100 times faster. But then you'll see I stopped at 2004, and it's kind of a good uh, rule of thumb that if somebody draws a plot like this, where the data is mysteriously chopped off uh, for an unknown reason, uh, the person who made the plot 
probably knows what data is lying beyond the, uh, the limit. And uh, they don't want to show it you because it somehow undermines their argument. And uh, this is the case here because, in fact, after the mid 2000s, the speed of a single computer processor stopped getting faster at the rate that, uh, that happened earlier. And the reason for this is kind of slightly mundane. There are several reasons, but the main reason is just to do with heat. So the more transistors you pack into a smaller space on the surface of a processor, the faster the, the chip is at, uh, at, at doing the calculations. You have to put more electrical power into the chip in order to drive all of those transistors. And the more power you put in, the more heat, the more waste heat comes out because this energy has to go somewhere. And by the mid 2000s, uh, dissipating all of this waste heat limited the performance of a single computer processor core. And the time it took for the uh, speed to double uh, was taking longer and longer. So they weren't getting faster anymore. But yet we don't notice this uh, in our daily lives. Computers seem to get more and more powerful all the time. And you can ask, how is this possible? The number of transistors has kept going up as I showed you on that plot. So how is it possible uh, that they can get faster and faster still, even though we have this limit of, of heat? And the reason is that modern computer processors have more than one core. So there are more than one uh, element of the processors that are, that are working on, on uh, working through these, these instructions, these mathematical problems that they're solving. Uh, and the, between them, the, share, the cores share work to allow them to continue to have increased performance. And it's highly likely if you look at your laptop, uh, if you get the information about your laptop or any computer that you've got, you'll see that it probably has more than one uh, core in there. So that's how uh, we've been enabled to continue. Computers have got continued to get more and more powerful, even though the performance of a single core uh, has not been getting uh, faster. And you can see this from this plot that I'm showing now. It's quite a lot to, uh, to digest. But if you look at the orange triangles, this is showing the number of transistors. That's the data I already showed you a few slides ago. And you can see that carries on going up according to this, this Moore's law. But you can see that the uh, speed for a single uh, computer processor has started to level off. And this clock speed, the frequency that I mentioned, has also leveled off after the 2000s. And the power in red that it consumes also leveled off for the reason of heat that I mentioned earlier. And then you can see at the bottom, these black points, the number of cores has been going up increasingly since the mid 2000s. And this is how we've managed to make computers continue to get faster and more performant. Um, but this can only work if the applications, the programs that people write for them are able to use all of these cores together. And that's been extremely important for Atlas in the last uh, few years. So if you don't use what we call concurrency, using more than one core at once, what you find uh, is that the, the, if you just set one of the cores to do the work, uh, it needs a certain amount of memory to, uh, to, do these, uh, to do the tasks. The memory is connected to the, uh, to, to the core. And in order to do the task it needs, it uses up almost all of the available memory. And then there's no spare memory left for any of the other cores to work on the, on the problems. So you end up wasting seven of the cores. Only one of them is able to do the work because there's only enough memory for one of them to do the task. Now, the kind of software that we currently use in Atlas is called multi-process. And here what happens is at the beginning of the computing task, uh, data is, uh, is dispatched to all of the cores. So all of them work on the problem and they share a certain amount of, uh, of memory that they need to do the task at the beginning. They still have to have a certain amount of memory uh, assigned individually to them, which still means that we can't add many extra cores. So uh, it's still expensive in memory to add additional cores. So this is still limiting, but at least it means we can make use of all of the uh, available cores as long as that number isn't too big. So in this diagram here, I'm showing eight. And then the kind of software that we will use from 2021 is called multi-threading. This is much more sophisticated. And with multi-threading, the memory is shared all the way through the computing task. And this means that uh, adding extra cores takes far less memory it means that we can add extra cores very cheaply, uh, by which I mean they don't add very much extra memory. And this means that the software is ready for uh, data centers 
that provide large numbers of core, but not very much memory, uh, extra memory per core. So this is how we will be working in Atlas from 2021. And this has been a big part of our work. It turns out that writing this kind of multi-threaded software is really quite difficult. And there's a very uh, well-known meme that goes around computer programmers that the theory of multi-threading looks like uh, you have on the uh, left-hand side and the practice of multi-threading looks like you have on the right-hand side. This is a, a bit of a joke. Uh, we, we even had a joke about this in Atlas because uh, my predecessor as computing coordinator uh, put this, uh, this flying pig on the ceiling of our office at CERN and said that once the uh, software was able to run multi-threaded, uh, we would uh, switch this pig on and it would fly around the office. And I'm very happy to say that because of the work of hundreds of people, uh, the multi-threaded Atlas software is now ready to fly in, in 2021 and the wings of this pig are already uh, twitching. So this is, this is very good news and we're very happy that we've been able to get to this position. So I now want to say uh, for, for a few minutes uh, something about data volumes. So you may have heard terms about bytes and bits, so I'll tell you briefly what these are. So one bit is simply a one or a zero. It's a signal in the, uh, in the processor, in these logic gates, that a switch should either be on or off. And if you put eight of these together, that makes a byte. And that is the basic unit of, uh, of, of, of data storage, of, uh, of data memory. Now, if you have an ebook on your Kindle or your iPad or whatever, uh, typically, uh, this ebook uh, is around 2 million bytes or around 2 megabytes. Not the whole of the Kindle, just one book. So that uh, sets that into context. And if you watch Netflix for about one hour in 4K quality, the best uh, available quality, then into your house you will stream around 3 billion bytes or about 3 gigabytes. So that's an hour of high quality Netflix. A typical desktop computer has the storage space of around 1 trillion bytes, and that's called a terabyte. And if you have a thousand of those, that's one petabyte. And that's kind of the unit of data storage that we typically work with. So in, later on in this talk, I'm going to be saying petabytes this and petabytes that. Just remember that one petabyte is about a thousand uh, desktop computers worth of, of storage. And the technology that we use to store uh, data has, has improved enormously over the, over the years. Uh, it all began with IBM's punched cards, which could store around 80 bytes. And the first magnetic disk storage system came out in 1956. And it could store 3.5 megabytes. So that's uh, just one and a half ebooks on your Kindle. Uh, and it costs $34,500, uh, $34, which after inflation is about 90 million US dollars per gigabyte. A uh, magnetic disk from 2021, which can store 10 terabytes, costs $265, which then means it's about 2.6 cents per gigabyte. So you can see how much cheaper magnetic storage has become. The very best kind of storage is solid state. This is very fast, but it's a bit more expensive. So you would pay, for instance, something like uh, 3.6 cents per gigabyte for a solid state storage. And uh, that's kind of like a flash drive that you might plug into your, your computer, for instance. And you might be surprised to hear that we actually still use magnetic tape as well. It looks very different from these kind of old school reels that you might have seen in old uh, pictures. And we use this for storing enormous amounts of data. So although a modern tape archive might cost more than $100,000, they can store hundreds of petabytes of data. And this is the cheapest. It comes to about two cents per gigabyte. And uh, in Atlas, we have about the disk and tape capacity for about 100 petabytes of, uh, sorry, 500 petabytes of, uh, of data. And just to finish off this introduction to computing, uh, to give you a sense of how much internet traffic is being moved around the world, uh, roughly every day around 10,000 petabytes are beamed around the, uh, the internet by uh, fixed telephony and, uh, and also uh, mobile uh, data. So that puts everything into context. So I'm now going to change topic slightly and talk a bit about, uh, about CERN and Atlas before I bring the two topics together. So in one slide, uh, CERN is the European Laboratory for Particle Physics. It's located in Geneva in Switzerland. It's the world's largest particle physics laboratory. Uh, it has two and a half thousand staff who are actually employed by CERN, but then there are 25, more than 25 CERN-based experiments 
Uh, and together, there are more than 12,000 scientists uh, representing uh, more than 600 institutes and universities from all over the world who either can work at CERN or they are using CERN facilities, but working uh, in, in other countries like, like I am. And the, the questions that CERN is seeking to ask, I'm just going to show these on one slide, but you can look at the other YouTube videos to find more about this. Questions such as what are the fund fundamental forces and particles in nature? Can we describe all of these forces with a single set of mathematics? How was the universe created? How will it evolve? What's the true nature of quantum mechanics? How does gravity fit in with all of these different elementary particles? And what are dark matter and dark energy? This is why we're, this is why we're here. These are the questions we're trying to ask. And this is CERN's pride and joy. It's the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's a particle accelerator, 27 kilometers in circumference. Uh, you can, this is an aerial photograph. You can see the Alps in the far background, Lake Geneva slightly nearer. Uh, and you can see this, you can't see very much of the accelerator above ground because it's 100 meters underground. But there are four experiments located at four points where the uh, beams of, uh, of particles collide. This is the kind of iconic shot of the Large Hadron Collider tunnel. The blue object is one of the magnets which we use to steer the particles around the, uh, around the accelerator. Uh, this is a schematic to show how it actually looks in more simple terms. So as I said, it's 100 meters underground and you have these four experiments, Atlas, LHCB, uh, CMS and ALICE, uh, which are spread out around the ring. And this schematic in the corner, the small one, sort of shows you the, the scale in a more realistic sense, how, it, uh, how, how deeply uh, buried the, uh, the experiments are. So the collisions that are occurring, uh, each beam, uh, each proton in the, in the beams, we're colliding beams of proton, um, have uh, uh, what we call 6.5 trillion electron volts worth of, of energy. That means that they're going at 99 point many, many nines percent of the speed of light. Uh, in each, we have uh, the, the protons move around the accelerator in bunches, and there are around 2,800 bunches of protons there. There are trillions of these protons in each bunch. And every time these bunches cross through each other, uh, uh, between, say, 30 and 60 uh, pairs of protons collide. Um, the, if you're interested, the total kinetic energy of all of those protons, if you add them all up, is about the same as a 200 meter long train running at about 150 kilometers an hour. When the beams are going around the accelerator, they're about the thickness of a human hair. And as you can see in this sort of diagram in the bottom corner, they are really brought into a very, very tight focus uh, when they're collided uh, to ensure that as many of them collide uh, as possible. So a sort of humorous way of depicting this is shown here. This is a very old picture from the 1970s, but uh, it's, uh, I still quite like it. So now I'm going to talk about ATLAS. So in one sense, ATLAS is a machine. It's a, it's a particle detector. It's very, very large, 44 meters long and 18 meters high. You can see a, a, a cutaway image uh, of it here. The particles uh, arrive in the bunches uh, from either end and they collide in the center. So the easiest way to think about the uh, a particle detector like this is that it's a giant digital camera. But it's a giant digital camera with a difference because it's in 3D. And it's also uh, a digital camera that can detect charged particles as well as photons which carry light. So that's the easiest way to think about a particle detector. It's a, it's a giant digital camera that can take in quotes photographs of the collisions that are occurring inside the, uh, inside the detector. But equally as important, ATLAS is also people. There are more than 4,000 of us in, in ATLAS and a similar number in, uh, in our opposite number, CMS. Um, it's made up of 180 different institutes, universities and labs across 40 countries. This picture was taken uh, shortly after the discovery of the Higgs boson. This is a celebration we had. I think this is the biggest gathering that ATLAS had. But even in this picture, there's only a tiny fraction of the total number of people on, uh, on ATLAS. So ATLAS is a detector, but e equally or more importantly, it's also people. So these collisions occur in the center of the detector uh, around 40 million times per second. And we only store around 1,000 of these per second for analysis. And the way we do this is by something called a trigger. Now, 40 million collisions per second equals something like 60 terabytes a second. And that's kind of the same amount of data that uh, a small country's worth of broadband connections would need to deliver. So of course, it's completely impossible to handle that amount of data. 
And it also turns out that most of that data isn't uh, of particular interest. So we can throw away almost all of this. And we do this in two stages. The first is done with hardware electronics that's based inside the detector. And it only has uh, uh, the time of one one thousandth of a second to determine whether to keep, to save the data from a, a, from a collision. This gets us down to about uh, 100,000 collisions per second, which is around the number of broadband connections in a small town. And we have a bit longer to deal with this. So we get the data out of the detector itself. We put it onto computers that are nearby the, uh, the experiment. And we have about half a second to decide whether we want to keep each of these uh, collisions. This gets us down to 1,000 per second, which is around the broadband connections in a big apartment building. Uh, and all of those are stored on tape. And this gives us something called raw data. And raw data is literally the data that comes out of the, uh, of the experiment. And then we do something called reconstruction to the raw data. And reconstruction is where we rebuild or try to rebuild the uh, particles that were emerging from the, uh, from the collision. The detector, as you kind of saw from the picture that I showed earlier, it's a series of layers. You can kind of imagine it as a, as a series of Russian dolls. And you have uh, more or less three components. There's the middlemost part called the inner detector. Then you have a section in the middle, which we called calorimeters. And then there's a section on the outside called the muon spectrometer. And they all do different jobs and detect different kinds of, of particle. And in this reconstruction step, what the software does is it merges them together and builds a, a, a global view of what happened in each collision. So we take the information from the inner detector, we make this into something called tracks, we combine that with information from the muon spectrometer to make muons, which are a kind of particle, subatomic particle. We also use information from this calorimeter system uh, to make electrons and photons. And then these basic objects are then combined to build the more complicated objects that we as physicists actually use to do our analysis. So this diagram maybe doesn't look too complicated. Uh, I've actually spared you some of the details because on the next slide, this is what it actually looks like. It's uh, afraid a bit more complicated than what I showed. This gives you the idea of how this works. We start off with basic levels of information and we build it up into more and more complicated uh, objects. And the way this data looks to a physicist uh, is it's like a very large table split across many, many computer files. And this table, the, the columns of the table are different variables for different kinds of objects. Now you have different numbers of objects um, in, in each uh, collision. So the number of columns can, can kind of change, but this is, gives you the view of what the, uh, of, of what the data looks like. And then the rows of this table are the events. And each row represents a single event. So if you read across one row, that gives you all the information about the tracks, the electrons, the photons, the jets, and all the other different uh, reconstructed objects, as we call them, that you need, that the physicist needs to do their analysis. So one row of these tables of data gives you one of these images. We very rarely look at images like that. We normally just use them for, uh, for, for, for essentially giving presentations so that people can see what the data looks like. Normally we see them these as rows of numbers and one row of numbers gives you one of these, uh, one of these images. And then the most important thing that we do is, is called, uh, or that individual physicists do is something called physics analysis, where we look at these tables of data uh, and we process these um, into uh, and, and, and through, a, through a process called physics analysis. This is done by individual physicists. And after many different steps, uh, we produce plots that look like this. This is a particularly famous plot because it shows the famous Higgs boson signal, which is, uh, which is, is visible here. Uh, and, uh, but, but to get from the tables that have come out of the reconstruction all the way to the, uh, to the plots look like this takes many steps. And I'm going to describe a few of these steps now. The first thing to note uh, is that there are two kinds of data shown on these plots. There are the black points which represent data, real data that we've recorded in the experiment. And then there are these colored blocks which are simulated data. We have to simulate data to understand how the detector uh, interacts with the particles. Uh, because uh, unless we simulate the behavior of the particles going through the detector, we're kind of blind to see how any uh, physics should affect, the, um, should affect how the data looks. So without simulated data, 
uh, it's very, very difficult to do analysis. So we have to do simulation as well as just recording the, uh, the, the, the data. Now for the simulation, uh, this, this is two steps. The first step is called event generation. And this is a kind of computer program that simulates the collision of the particles in the detector. And then the evolution of this collision into the particles that we see as they fly through the detector. And the second step uh, is called uh, detector simulation where we simulate the interaction of the detector um, with, the, uh, with, with the particles as they fly through it, how they deposit their energy into the detector and how this energy then gets turned into digital signals. This second part is done with something called digitization and the output of this looks very much the same as the raw data that comes out of the experiment. Both of these things are done with Monte Carlo methods, which rely on random numbers to um, produce the uh, to, to, to simulate the collisions and the interaction with the with the experiment. And this means that we have a, a processing chain that has sort of two legs. The leg on the left hand side is the leg followed by the data, the real data that's recorded by the experiment. And the leg on the uh, right hand side is the is the leg that's followed by the simulated data and then in the end the simulated data and the real data are analyzed together to give you these plots that you saw on the previous slide where you have simulated data superimposed on on real data all of these steps apart from the very last stage of analysis are done with a, a data processing framework called athena which is uh, atlas's uh, data processing framework so how much resources are used by each of these steps. Uh, you can see this from the, the pie chart that I'm, I'm showing here. What you'll see very obviously is that simulation uh, is the part that dominates. This is what uses most of our computing power. And the reason for this is that simulating these things called calorimeters, this is the middle part of the, uh, of the detector which measures the energy, is very compute intensive because there are lots of layers of material that have to be simulated uh, in a very precise way. We can speed this up with something called fast color simulation or fast color sim. I'll say a bit more about that slightly later on. And then you can see the other processes, things like the event generation and then the reconstruction and the analysis and preparation of analysis data take somewhat less. And this gives you an overall idea of, uh, of, of how much computational resources we're using. Now you now be, be probably asking, what do we actually run all of this computation on? And the answer is we use something called the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, which is known in, uh, in our field uh, as the grid. And the grid is a network of 170 data centers spread out uh, across 42 countries. Uh, it's shared by the four LHC experiments. Um, it can transfer up to 50 gigabytes a second. Uh, which equates to around 50 million files per week. In terms of how much computation it can do, uh, it can process 2 million computational tasks a day on average, and it has 1 million computer cores. And in terms of storage, it has more than 1,000 petabytes, or as we call it, an exabyte of storage available on disk and tape, which is spread out across all of those data centers. Now, the different experiments organize the way they use the grid in different ways, but the way Atlas uses it uh, is that we have two kinds of data center. There's one called nucleus data centers, and these are big data centers that manage uh, the requests for computer services, which we call tasks. And then there are smaller data centers connected to them that take some of the workload from the, uh, from the nucleus. And the connection between these data centers, particularly the biggest ones, uh, is uh, using a private optical network called LHC OPN. And this is what we use to transfer the data between the different uh, data centers. So to drive a computing grid, uh, you need three pieces of software. Uh, there's something called a task manager which is the software that determines what computer tasks should be dispatched to which data centers. There's something called a data manager, which keeps track of what data is stored at the different data centers. And then there's finally something called monitoring, which uh, enables you to look at what's going on across the whole of the, uh, of the computing grid. And that certainly in Atlas, but also in some of the other experiments, uh, these are the three, uh, the names of the three software components we use. The task manager is called Panda. The data manager, which is now used quite widely, is something called Ruccio. And the monitoring is provided by CERN, and it's called Monit. 
So these are the three pieces of software that we use, need to use to bind all these data centers together and turn them into a single computing grid that can do our, our work. This is just a screenshot to show you what Monit can do. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see all the different kinds of plots uh, that we can use to monitor what's going on as our jobs are, are running and as data is being transferred. So how do we use the grid? So uh, first of all, uh, when we record data on Atlas, um, it has to be, this is raw data, it's extremely valuable, it cannot be replaced. So we have to keep two copies of this. We keep one copy on tape at CERN, and then we keep a second copy uh, on one of these other data centers. So we spread the data out all over the world so that if something bad happens in one of the data centers, it's all right because we've got a second copy that we, we can then distribute. So we spread the raw data around. And then in addition, uh, freshly recorded data is reconstructed, turned into objects that we can understand also at CERN. So the CERN, CERN has a very large data center, which we call a tier zero. It does the initial reconstruction. And then again, we spread that data all, all across these data centers that are on the, uh, on the grid. So then we have the reconstructed data sitting on the grid. And then we have to do uh, our simulation and we have to reconstruct our simulated events. And we do this using the entire grid. So different grid sites are put to work doing different uh, reconstruction and simulation tasks. And once these tasks are finished, this leaves us with data files and simulated files spread out all over these different data centers. And then these files are used by individual physicists who are doing their physics analysis. So individual analysts are then using the different data centers to process their, uh, to, to run, their own, um, run their own analysis and to do their own research. So how is this actually done? What is an individual physicist doing when they look at the data that has been uh, recorded and, and stored? So there, it's done in two steps. The first step, we call this bulk analysis, and this is always done uh, on the grid. And what happens is that the, the, the physicist, an individual physicist sitting in a university, writes a computer program that will scan over thousands of files, over millions or billions of events, and that's terabytes or even petabytes of data. And the first thing that they do is they select the interesting events, by events, of course, I mean collisions or rows of the table, and only select the ones that are of relevance to the kind of physics studies that they are doing. And then they apply, using their computer program, calibrations and corrections to the data, because the data, as it's uh, reconstructed, usually isn't perfectly calibrated. You have to apply various extra, um, uh, you have to apply extra steps to, to, to somehow correct the data, uh, to, to uh, apply our latest understanding of what the, uh, the data looks like. So this is also done at this stage. And then finally, the physicist decides which variables they need to actually run their, their analysis. And they can throw away the rest. And then they uh, write this uh, into files. We call them root entuples. That's the name. Root is the, uh, an analysis framework that's used across uh, all of the CERN experiments. And then they save this back to disk for them to use. Uh, and the difference between the files that they are saving uh, are uh, uh, sort of the sizes gigabytes to terabytes, whereas the size of the files that they have been reading and running their program on are terabytes to petabytes. So we're talking really a factor of a thousand smaller. And these files are small enough for them to then analyze directly on them, look at directly on their own laptop. So you have all of these data centers spread out. And so you, you might be asking how the poor physicist is supposed to know where the data is and which site they're supposed to use and how they log on to all these different data centers and so on. Well, the answer is they don't have to do this because the system does it for them automatically. So this is how it works. The physicist writes the program for doing the steps that I showed on the previous slide. And they also put together a list of the data sets that they need to process. This is real data and the simulated data that they need to process in order to do their analysis. And then uh, using some software, they send this to this task manager, this thing called Panda. And they don't, so they don't have to decide where it goes. They just send it to a server, which is actually at CERN. And it decides where uh, this, uh, what, what should be done with this task. So the first thing that this task manager does 
is it asks the data manager, where are these files? Where are these data sets that this user wants to access? Whereabouts are they? And the, the data manager will tell the task manager automatically where these data sets are. And this then enables the task manager to decide which data centers to use. So the first thing that happens at these data centers, once the work has been dispatched to them by this task manager, is the input data which is needed is transferred from the disks of the, uh, of the site of the data center to the computing elements. And the computing elements, the, the processors, then work on that uh, program that the, uh, com that the physicist has written. And, do, and start to uh, run through all the files. The physicist can monitor the progress, again, using Panda, they can just go on a web page and they can see the progress that their jobs are making as the uh, data centers chew through their, their analysis. And then once the jobs are finished, the results, which are now a lot smaller, as I showed earlier, are transferred back onto the disks of the site where the, uh, the jobs ran. And then finally, the physicist, if they want, can download these results directly to their laptop or to their, their university uh, cluster and can uh, then do their analysis uh, doing, uh, using, uh, using local resources. And this local analysis is the second step. We call it final analysis. Uh, and this is, as I said, usually done on, the, on their local computers or even their laptop if they've been very efficient in reducing the size of their data sets. And I should stress that 90% or more of the work of an average physicist is spent at this step. The step that I described earlier um, is, is the, uh, it's the step that's sort of interesting from the point of view of understanding how the grid works. But from the point of view of how a physicist works, most of their job is spent after this is done. And once they've got these small files on their laptops. And they're doing, kind of, they're doing the kind of work involving things like machine learning training, they're studying the backgrounds uh, to the processes that they're interested in. They're looking at the uncertainties of their data, systematic uncertainties. They're doing statistical analysis, many, many other tasks. And finally, they're making their, their plots, which are what go into the, uh, into the publications. And this is done using a very large number of tools. The, the linchpin of all of this is this root uh, data analysis framework, which is provided by CERN and is used across the experiments. But we also use many other different software packages for machine learning and statistical analysis. We use, thing, use things like TMVA, scikit-learn, TensorFlow. And recently, there's been a trend towards using Python for doing the final step of, the, uh, of this uh, physics analysis. And uh, most recently, uh, physicists have become, begun to use more and more uh, these uh, mighty Jupyter notebooks, where you can uh, directly use a web interface um, to, to do your analysis in, an, in a very uh, user-friendly and, and interactive way. I've shown a little screenshot of this. And actually CERN provides uh, a facility for doing this using their data center, which is called SWAN. So there are many different ways for physicists to work. There are almost as many ways for physicists to work as there are physicists, uh, but we have this huge range of tools, uh, some of them from within the particle physics community and some of them from outside it that we are using to do our, do our analysis. So now in the, uh, the last, uh, let's say, uh, five minutes or so, um, I have some, uh, I, I, I want to talk a bit about the future, or as I call it, the high luminosity future, because um, in uh, the late 2020s, the LHC is going to get a serious upgrade. So this uh, plot here, there's quite a lot of information to digest, but on the, uh, the, the red dots, they more or less show the uh, rate that collisions have occurred at, how many collisions per second you can almost uh, envisage this is. And you can see that this has grown steadily uh, over the, uh, over the, the years. Um, the, the, the blue uh, bands, which are labeled LS1, LS stands for long shutdown. These are periods of time when the machine has been switched off for maintenance and upgrade. The blue line is showing the total volume of data that's been recorded. So you can see uh, that the amount of data has grown uh, steadily over the, uh, over the years. We're uh, going to start in 2022. The next run is called run three. Uh, and we're going to be recording data roughly at the same rate that we were recording it towards the end of the previous run in 2018. But then during this long shutdown three, which will occur in the mid 2020s, 
the Large Hadron Collider is going to be seriously upgraded and it's going to turn into the high luminosity LHC. And you can see that after this period, these red dots shoot up, meaning that the uh, rate at which the collisions will take place is much higher. And you can see that the slope at which the data is being recorded also shoots up, meaning that we're going to be recording, well, uh, something like 20 times more data than we recorded during the whole of 2010 to 2018, or 10 times more data than we will record in 2022 to 2025. And whereas we have something, you know, like 30 to 60 collisions per bunch crossing now, when we have the high luminosity Large Hadron Collider, there will be more than 200 of these collisions in each of the uh, crossings of the bunches. So we're talking about massively more data to process to go alongside that, we need massively more simulated data, and this is a huge load on the uh, on the computing. And we're going to have to do things very differently uh, in order to uh, in, in in order to uh, to be able to cope with this amount of data. So, how are we going to meet these challenges? So, the first and perhaps most obvious thing is to make the existing software run more efficiently. This is what we call optimization, and we're working on this um, all the time. We also want to be able to use new computational technologies. And in particular, uh, I'm talking here about graphics processing units or GPUs. I'm gonna say a bit more about that in the next slide. And related to this, we could also make more use of machine learning, uh, including for doing the simulation, but for doing uh, a number of, uh, for, for doing many other tasks um, as well. We could also write smaller data formats. So try to write slightly less data. Um, or we could make more use of tape. I said earlier on that tape is cheaper, that is the cheapest form of storage. And if we can make more use of this, then this will enable us to, small, to store more data for the same amount of investment. And then there are ideas to do uh, more on-demand uh, data analysis. So you don't have to go through all the steps that I showed you earlier on that the physicists needs to go through to run their analysis jobs that you would be able to get the, uh, the data on in an on-demand way probably using these much smaller data formats. Now, this is a topic in itself, and I don't have time to go into the details of, of all of this, but I, I do want to say something about graphics processing units because this is what we call a hot topic at the moment. Um, so the things I've been discussing uh, earlier on, uh, they're what we call CPUs, uh, central processing units, and these have a small number of very high power computer cores. So in, typically you have maybe something like eight of these cores, like I was discussing earlier. Um, and these are optimized for very complex, but largely serial um, tasks. And you can, as, as I described earlier, you can uh, allow, allow these processes to share the work using either multi-processing or multi-threading. Now a GPU uses exactly the same technology. It's still the same kind of silicon and the same kind of logic gates, but they're designed slightly differently. You have far more of these cores, potentially thousands of them, or even tens of thousands of them, rather than just say four or eight or 16, but they are much lower power. So there's less problem with the heating and they're drawing less electricity. They're lower powered, they are slower, but because there are so many of them, if you can write software that can be massively paralleled, um, run massively in parallel, you can really get very, very significant speed ups. These were originally designed for doing graphics processing, particularly for things like gaming, where you need very high speed graphics. And more recently, uh, they've been used for doing machine learning. And we're very interested uh, in Atlas, but also in the other LHC experiments about using these for doing more of our data processing. So there are two ways we could think of doing this. Uh, the first is to try to exist to migrate our existing workflow so that the CPU and the GPU would kind of work hand in hand. So the CPU, which would, would start work, it would come across some big parallel task that it, it would be quite slow at doing. And it would hand that over to the GPU, which will work on this big parallel task. And whilst it's working on this big parallel task, the CPU can just work on, on something else in the, in the software. And once the GPU is finished, the CPU can use the results that it has produced, and then it can pass on to the next uh, big parallel task. The alternative to this uh, is to uh, develop workflows which can largely be uh, run using machine learning or artificial intelligence. And as I uh, implied a few minutes ago, uh, artificial intelligence machine learning applications 
run very well on these uh, graphics processing units, these GPUs, because they are inherently parallelizable in, in this way. Um, now, it's almost certainly the case that we will end up doing a combination of two of both of these things. So some of our software will run on, uh, on it will be using the existing workflows, but somehow migrated so that CPU and GPU can work on it together. And then some of our workflows will use machine learning um, app will, will be uh, developed using machine learning workflows. And this is going to be the, 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 the work for us now for the next several years uh, until the, uh, until the um, high luminosity LHC starts up in, uh, in, in, late, in the late 2020s. And on, on simulation, this is really the last topic I have to, to talk about. Um, there's the possibility, in fact, we already do this to some extent, of using deep learning to do our, our simulation. So you may have seen in the media uh, something called uh, deep fakes. All of these images of the people here, uh, they're not real people. They've all been generated by a neural network, by an artificial intelligence, uh, which, and the technique we use for doing this is called generative adversarial techniques. Now, I don't know about you, but I find these, uh, these things quite creepy, but fortunately the particle physics community has come up with a much more wholesome use for these uh, techniques. And that's for doing uh, simulation. So we have applied uh, these generative adversarial networks to this very time-consuming calorimeter simulation that I talked about earlier. And uh, we've developed, uh, Atlas has developed something called Fast Color GAN. If you can Google for this uh, document, you can even read about it. And already, um, even now in 2021, this technique outperforms the existing fast calorimeter simulation that we've already written. So the question is, can techniques like this be used elsewhere in the simulation or elsewhere in the reconstruction or even in the event generation where we simulate the, uh, the collisions? And this is going to be a big question for, uh, for, the, next, uh, for the next run. Um, I, I should point out that machine learning and the high luminosity LHC might actually be topics for future talks. Uh, in this series. So please keep your eye on the Atlas social media feeds for more information. Uh, now, I'm almost at the end now, but we're going to have uh, hopefully some discussion. Um, now, in, in, in particle physics, as I think in every walk of life, we, we kind of have the, a, a love-hate relationship with computers. You have this person here saying what they're trying to do is really simple. It shouldn't be hard. And their friend is telling them that really computers are just very well organized sand, the silicon, and everything is hard until, it, uh, until somebody else makes it easy. And this person's obviously getting frustrated and they say, well, maybe I should just turn this one back into sand. And their friend says, well, I'll find you a blowtorch. So this is kind of a humorous way of saying that although sometimes computers and software can be incredibly frustrating things, uh, we definitely can't work without them. And actually uh, developing software for the, uh, for the next generation of, uh, of colliders for the LHC is a, an incredible um, intellectual challenge in, in itself uh, alongside physics. So uh, with that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. Uh, and at this stage, I think we can have some, uh, some questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, James. I mean, it's a pity that this is not a, a public talk with audience so we could all clap. So this was a fantastic <laughs> talk. I think I, I enjoyed it very much. And the, the flying pig story was just brilliant. <laughs> so then I guess you are you are ready for the Q&A, right? Yes. All right. So I'm going to ask you to stop sharing your slides so yes. people can see you a yeah. little bit bigger. Excellent. Yeah. So then I think we can just get into them. So we are starting asking, I mean, we're starting with questions from Instagram. So these are gonna be the first one. So this is now the time for you to type your questions here in the chat in YouTube and send us some more. And also of course, keep asking in Instagram as well. So, all right. So let's see. The first question that we have for you today is the following. So since when have you used machine learning techniques, particularly in the trigger system? Can you well, answer that? Yeah, so in fact, machine learning is nothing new in, in particle physics. Uh, it was even being used uh, in the predecessor to the, uh, to the LHC in, in LEP when I was still uh, at school. Um, and, and very simple neural networks and then slightly more complicated um, systems called, uh, well, slightly different 
uh, machine learning techniques called boosted decision trees were being used uh, in, um, in, 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 in those experiments. They were instrumental in discovering something called the top quark in, uh, in the uh, early 2000s. So machine learning really isn't anything new, but what has changed in the last few years is that as computers have got more and more powerful, and also as the tools have been written outside of our field, it's become easier and easier to do something called deep learning, where you have these extremely complicated neural networks uh, that have enabled us to, uh, to do more and more um, powerful analysis using, uh, using machine learning. So I think the answer to the question is that uh, machine learning in particle physics predates ATLAS uh, it was used in the uh, in the Tevatron in the in the nineties um, and two thousands and even before that. Um, it's just that in the m more recent years, uh, it's become a lot more powerful. Um, and and in fact, we already use machine learning even in the reconstruction. We use it in the uh, in the uh, early stage of the tracking to do something called pixel clustering, and we also use it in something called flavor tagging. So um, yeah, it's it's really uh, had a long history. It's just that. Recently, um, it's become so much more powerful because of computers and because of the developments in industry and so on that we've been able to sort of jump on this and use it more intensively. And as I say, in the HLHC in the future, we expect to be using it um, even more than, than we are now. Right. Did, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> I think it did. However, I have to tell you that there are a lot of questions right into this topic. So then mm. there is like a quite a straightforward follow up. That is, uh, how much do they improve physics analysis, this machine learning techniques? Well, um, let's say normally we're not talking about, well, okay, let's put it one way. There are some physics analyses that it would be very difficult to do at all without it. Uh, just because the background processes are uh, so big in comparison with the signal. So, for example, I think it would be very difficult to do um, something like Higgs to WW, Higgs, Higgs boson decaying into two W bosons without using some kind of machine learning. It's not necessarily uh, these very deep neural networks. It may just be uh, some kind of thing like a boosted decision tree, which we've been using for years. But without some kind of, of machine learning, it would be extremely difficult to, to do this. Now, when it comes to deep learning, we're only at the beginning. We're usually talking about improvements of something, you know, the order of percents over what we, we have already from simpler machine learning techniques. But these deep learning techniques really come into their own when they're given a lot more data. So if you have massive quantities of training data, you can get much more um, performance from them. So, uh, yeah, I think to summarize, in terms of simpler machine learning techniques, uh, it would be very difficult to do a lot of our physics without them. In fact, I would almost go as far as to say that almost, not all, but almost all physics analysis now in, in ATLAS uses some kind of machine learning or multivariate analysis, as we sometimes more traditionally call it. Mm -hmm. And the deep analysis is now starting to find its way into uh, deep neural networks and deep learning is starting to find its way into analysis. I think this is, by the way, clear that we're going to need another outreach talk on, on machine learning and AI in in physics, because I didn't have time to discuss much of it, but it's clearly something people are very interested in. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's something that is coming up, so mm. we can all look yep. forward to that. But it's obviously so related, right? That is mm, exactly it's normal that the questions yep. yeah. that the questions come. Mm. All right, so then I think we can move on from the machine learning and just think about having this for a future talk and think about things that are a little bit more related to your talk. So there is something that uh, is been asked uh, that I, I want to ask you, I don't know if you're gonna know the answer, but how many lines of code does Atlas use? Millions and millions. <laughs> Actually, I wanted to look this number up in order to put it in the code, but I was a bit in the slides, uh, but I was a bit reticent because there are different ways of defining. What I should have said is that some of the software we use, uh, particularly for the event generation and for the simulation, uh, is not written by Atlas. It's written by bodies that are external to Atlas. Mm -hmm. And then there's the code, which is in Atlas. And then, of course, you have to decide, do you also count the analysis code, which is written by physicists? But let's say we are talking about, um, let's say, millions of lines, uh, not, not hundreds of millions of lines, but millions uh, of lines. 
Um, some of it in C++ for the, the sort of hardcore calculations. And then some of it in Python, which is what we use for configuring the software. And as I said, it's also used a lot for, uh, for analysis as well. So I think you are asking, answering actually right now a question that is also answered, but maybe you want to elaborate a little bit on that. That is, uh, what software languages do you use to process data? Right. So yeah, uh, that's a that's a good question because uh, C plus plus is our what I would call our core language. Um, it's the language that we use for really doing the event generation simulation when we have high high volumes of calculations to do. We use C plus plus. But C++, um, I mean, it's, it's a tough language to, to learn. It's, it's, it's quite complicated and uh, you, you have, it's very powerful, but with power comes responsibility and it can be quite tricky to, to get it right. So um, for, for, for uh, applications that are more facing, let's say, the user, we use Python. So for instance, we configure the software using Python. So we give instructions rather than have, if we need to change the settings of the software, then we will use Python to change the settings. We don't change the C++ if we want to change the settings. We just use different Python. Uh, and that uh, means that we can very easily uh, change the configuration of the software without recompiling it. Um, and also, as I said, although many people still use C++ for analysis, more and more people are now moving to Python for their physics analysis, just because Python is a friendly, user friendly way of doing things. It's more often taught in universities now than, uh, than C++. So a lot of students come to, uh, to CERN or to the experiments uh, knowing more Python than they know C++. And also uh, there's a lot of um, software for, for instance, machine learning and for all kinds of graphics and so on, uh, which are also written in Python that you can just grab from the, uh, from the internet there, it's freeware. Uh, and, uh, and it's very well documented. And so a lot of physicists are now using this. Um, now, uh, when we go to uh, GPUs, that opens up an, another zoo uh, because there are different languages for different manufacturers of GPU. So the biggest manufacturer of GPU is NVIDIA that uses a programming language called CUDA, which is very similar to C++, but it has certain special features and uh, different um, manufacturers have different proprietary languages. So that's gonna be actually a big challenge when we start using GPUs. How are we going to be able to write one version of the software for all of these different kinds of, uh, of, um, of GPU? So yeah, to answer the question, C++ for the heavy duty stuff, Python for the configuration, and, um, and, and then uh, yeah, potentially uh, other, other things when it gets to, uh, to GPUs. All right, I think that's a very nice uh, comprehensive answer. So following up on this one, there is a question about what kind of applications are actually used. So it's not, it's a little bit beyond the, mm. the languages. Yeah. So, well, um, in terms of the data processing frameworks uh, that we are, that we, that we use in Atlas, it's a homemade thing called Athena. And this is a C++ based framework. And that's the framework which drives when we're running it, the event generation, the simulation, the reconstruction. Um, and that's, uh, that's our sort of big framework. And um, there are software, external software packages that plug into this uh, that we use for doing the event generation. So there are event generators with names like Pythia and Herwig. And they, these are all written by, by researchers in different uh, universities and, and laboratories. The big simulation package that we use is called Jayant 4. Uh, that's written mainly by, uh, well, it's a big, a big collaboration. Um, and that also plugs into our Athena framework for doing uh, simulation. And then for analysis, uh, we use something called Root. Now, Root is a big software framework, which is known by everyone in, in particle physics. Um, and it provides many things. It provides an interface for doing analysis in both C++ and in Python. It provides uh, software for drawing plots, histograms and other kinds of plots. All of the plots that you, many of the plots, at least that you see coming out of CERN have been drawn using root. But it also provides um, what we call an IO layer, an input output layer. So all the data formats or most of the data formats that we write in, in Atlas are based on this root uh, IO layer. So uh, most of the files can be read using this root framework as well. And then the root framework itself can plug into 
other software packages, these things uh, based on Python that I mentioned, we can we can make use of um, of these. So yeah, for for a person on Atlas, um, the 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 data process, the main application is um, is is Athena for, for for doing this bulk processing. But the average analyst will most often be interacting with Root, with Jupyter notebooks to do their their Python, with things like Scikit-Learn, and this these are the sort of things which. Um, data scientists uh, in other fields would be very, um, very familiar with. Um, and then, and as, I mean, I guess the question people might also think, what uh, operating systems do we use? Well, for doing the bulk data processing, we use Linux. Um, and uh, a lot of people use Linux per personally as well on their laptops. Uh, and then a lot of people use Macs for, um, because all of these uh, analysis tools, Root will run on a Mac, for instance, as will all of this Python-based stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the applications that we, um, we tend to use. We don't use spreadsheets very often. That's the one application that we don't really use very often in, uh, in physics research. That's true. <laughs> all right, so thank you for the answer. I think it was uh, very comprehensive. and. Uh... Very nice. But maybe it's time to come back a little bit to Trigger. I think it's Trigger has caught the mm -hmm. attention of, of the audience today. Mm -hmm. So how sure are the physicists that the Trigger selection does not reject possible new physics events that might have different signatures than oh, otherwise that's a expected? Ver that's a very, very good question. And the answer yeah. is, we don't know. <laughs> um, we good. don't know for a fact that we are not throwing away new physics. Um, the problem is that um, we are not able to, because as I said earlier, if we wanted to record every single event that the uh, Atlas experiment sees, uh, we would need a, you know, the, a, a colossal amount of storage at 60 terabytes a, a second or, or something like that. So we have to make choices and the choices that we make are that we, we look primarily for what we call high momentum, high transverse momentum. So where the physics signature goes straight into the, the main bulk of the detector at rather a, a high angle uh, or very high energy events or events with very large jet or with very energetic jets where lots of particles appear to be focused into a very small space that leave a very obvious signature behind in the detector. Now, we can uh, record a small fraction of the uh, what we call lower, let's say, lower transverse momentum events but we can't afford to store all of them because the data volumes are just too big. So we can sort of look at small fractions of them um, and to see if there's anything interesting there. The other thing that we might be able to do in, in, in the future, and this is people are looking at this, and I think probably the talk from, from Christian that was already on YouTube may have talked about this, the dark matter talk, is that we can look at long-lived particles where something flies uh, really along most particles, they, they uh, decay, the, new, the, the heavy particles, they decay inside the beam pipe. So by the time Atlas sees them, they've decayed into much smaller, lighter particles. But it's possible that there are new, some new physics models give you a particle that can fly quite deep into the detector. And this is something that we could also um, trigger on. But again, to come back really to the question that the, uh, the, 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 the um, viewer has asked, we don't know for a fact that we have not thrown away interesting physics and we do have to make choices based on our assumptions about what new physics will look like. But as soon as we switch on that trigger, we are biasing the data. Uh, we call the trigger that looks at the very um, low angle data, this uh, low PT data, we call that the minimum bias trigger, but it's not a uh, zero bias. You know, I mean, it's still, there's still some bias if you want both ends of the detector to be lighting up at the same time. So the answer is, yeah, the, the trigger is, um, is, is the thing that enables us to work with a reasonable amount of data that we can handle. But equally, we have no guarantees that we are not throwing away interesting physics. And that's, um, that, that's the life of, uh, <laughs> of experimental particle physics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we have to live with that. We so. have to live with it, exactly. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for that answer. I think it was it was also great, and I'm I'm happy that you touched only particles that are very dear to my heart. So, all right. So now for a completely change of topic and something that I was sure was gonna come out in this talk, the next question is the following: Is quantum computing being used at CERN or Atlas? Right. I was thinking about making a slide on quantum computing, uh, and then I um, decided against it. Uh, I, I was also expecting this question, so. Now then, um, the 
people are definitely looking at quantum computing um, in various uh, experiments, in including Atlas. And you, you see talks about this. Now, what should be stressed is that at the moment, uh, quantum computers of the kind that we could use in experimental particle physics don't exist. Maybe I should explain a little uh, in my limited knowledge of quantum computers, what they actually are for those who, who don't know. So whereas with a classical computer, the bits are either zero or one, these bits that I showed, with a quantum computer, you have something called a qubit, where through the magic of quantum mechanics, you can have a combination of zeros or ones. And this enables you, in, in theory at least, to do certain kinds of calculation far, 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 far faster um, than, a, than a classical computer can do. But the problem at the moment is quantum computers in any meaningful sense don't really exist in a form that we could actually use them. So at the moment, the work that people are doing um, across the different uh, physics experiments in, in, uh, at CERN is that they're, simulate, they're using simulations of quantum computers. So a, a normal computer simulates how a quantum computer would work. And then these uh, people try to work on programs that will computer programs that could run on a quantum computer should it in the future uh, be brought into being. Now, I give you a, an alert that I'm going to give you an opinion my, now. I, maybe I will be proved totally wrong about this. Uh, my personal view is I do not believe that quantum computers will be able to help as much for the high luminosity LHC. That's the phase of the LHC that will start in the late 2020s. Mo even, even quite um, uh, aggressive predictions for quantum computers are talking about something like 20 or 30 years before practical, usable quantum computers are, are made of, available. Uh, and that type kind of takes us out of the um, immediate uh, use. So from my perspective, what I'm interested in is GPUs because they definitely exist. <laughs> uh, we can buy them now. It's certainly important that people work on, on quantum computing, but I think this is a very, very futuristic um, thing. And I, I, I suspect that People who are entering Atlas now as students will be, uh, you know, senior scientists uh, before they see kind of quantum computers coming in the um, in any in any meaningful sense. Uh, I mean, you know, they're making huge progress in companies like Google and, and others, but uh, they are still many years away from a practical, usable quantum um, quantum computer. So, yeah, that's that's my but that's my personal view. Maybe I'll be proved wrong. And in five years time. <laughs> We'll be uh, forgetting about GPUs and we'll be worrying about quantum computers. But I personally don't believe that will be the, the case. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good answer as well. So I'm not, I'm not going to use it. <laughs> so, all right. So I think uh, we are getting close to wrap up, but we might have a couple more questions. So one that comes from here from the live chat is uh, which GPUs are being considered for certain experiments? Well, uh, th at the moment, uh, it's this is a completely open question. Uh, I mean, it's it's clear at the moment um, that the easiest ones to use because of their availability and also because the programming language is is the easiest to use and the most advanced is is NVIDIA. But that no mean by no means is the this does not mean that we will be using NVIDIA forever. We'll probably end up using a mixture of different manufacturers uh, of GPUs. Um, I mean, we're talking here about GP GPUs. So these are generally sort of um, what they call server class GPUs. It's not typically the kind of graphics cards that gamers will have in their, um, in their gaming PCs. They're, they're a bit more powerful than this and they typically are in data centers rather than in... Um, but yeah, I mean, the, for instance, in the uh, US, uh, different um, very powerful computers are being built and they're buying the GPUs from different vendors, not just from NVIDIA, but also from, uh, from uh, Intel and, and, and AMD and other vendors as well. So yeah, uh, at the moment, it's a totally open question. If, you want to, if people want to know what kind of GPUs are we mostly working with at the moment to develop and to experiment and to find out how we may use them in the future, uh, the answer is mostly at the moment to NVIDIA, but um, that's not to say that this will be the case uh, for forever. Thank you very much for that. And I think then we are 
about to close, so probably we give you the very last question that is going to be a little bit more on the personal side. Mm -hmm. So that question is, how many gigabytes does your computer have? <laughs> Memory and storage. My personal computer. <laughs> my laptop. Yes. Right. So, well, uh, it's a very, very uh, old one. Uh, my, my laptop is from 2015. Oy. So uh, I think even it's on the slides, actually, because I, I didn't I didn't draw my attention to it. So it's dual core. Um, uh, it's a dual core uh, MacBook Air um, and memory. Uh, I th ah, now, I, I remember I asked the university that I wanted one with a really good memory. So it's eight gigabytes because I wanted to have very fast. Ah, no, no, that wasn't available. My personal computer is eight, but this one is four. So two cores and four gigabytes. And just as a bit of a humorous joke to finish, I said, I don't care, you know, what color it is or how big the screen is, but I really, really want it to have uh, an, a UK or a US keyboard. Please don't give me a Norwegian keyboard with these. Anyway, so my new laptop arrived and there it was, uh, an or, an ear and on, on my keyboard. So now I have to remember what the keystroke is to, uh, to get the, uh, the programming symbols, which are replaced with Norwegian uh, letters. So, yeah. So that's my very old, uh, very old laptop. Uh, well, I can relate, but it, it was fun. All right. So then I think maybe it's time then to, to wrap up for, for today. And I just want to thank you, James, very much again. I think this was a fantastic talk. And this Q&A session was very interesting and really engaging and fun. So thank you very much for having you us today. And thanks, everybody, for connecting to, to this talk. And uh, we are very happy that you are here. <laughs> and don't forget to subscribe to the Atlas channel. We will come back with more live talks in the future. So stay tuned. And thank you very much. So Great. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Goodbye.